Ram Garu very kindly says, I came all the way from India to only discover Gundur and Krishna district here. <laughs> so, all, all very innocently this morning I sit in a meeting and someone says, I am Mr. Savant So Goginelli. And here I sit down and he says, look, I am a Goginelli too. So, I don't know if I came really a long way. <laughs> we came a long way. Yes, that's right. It's a great pleasure and honor to speak on the subject that Ramda proposed. Uh, there is a reason uh, he explained why I should be addressing certain issues. And this fantastic array of things that seem to be done and accomplished with technology. Um, and the stark contrast to that, that culturally we are perhaps not of a level where we can take the fullest advantage of the science and the scientific approach behind the technology that we are talking about. So this distinction between what science is and what technology there is and how that can change the way we live and our lives. How is it that it is not changing the way we think even though it does bring in amenities and facilities in life? And he was pointing out that in the south of this country uh, such a reflection is more relevant than perhaps in the north, the east or the northwest. So I thought we would then talk about the culture of science. The reason I said the culture of science is those of us who are familiar with the discussions in the Indian community, in the South Asian community, is this constant, very uninteresting proposal that science has no values and you would get your values from religion. Let's take it at face value. That religion gives us values and science does not. Let's also look at the situation of religion in the world. Most people are religious. The largest religion being Christianity at 3 billion. And then 1.5 billion with Muslims. And let's look at the countries where these religions are flourishing. Would we qualify these regions as regions with lots of good values? This is a test of that claim that religion would give you values. At a practical level, it seems to accomplish nothing. Uh, some of the world's most religious countries, Afghanistan, Nigeria, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, also figure in the topmost corrupt countries of the world. Uh, the ones where human rights are denied to almost everyone. The ones where a hierarchical system of society is considered the way life should be. And any attempt to change that would be an assault on social harmony. And therefore it has to be resisted with the most robust reaction possible. So I can't buy into the argument that a lot of religion would bring a lot of values for these reasons. Also I find that if you would say, oh that's not religion, that's somebody who didn't understand Sanskrit well and they got the Arabic wrong and the Hebrew was corrupt and therefore the real religion is something else and you sit down with the books. I can't see one single of these books which says all humans are equal, not one. I can't see any of these have ever been attributed to a woman. All these systems of thinking, so to say, I believe it's systems of non-thinking, none of them has ever been authored by either a male, a male god, or a female god, or a female. They've all been written by men. So I'm uncomfortable with this claim in all ways, that the text, the practice, or the thought has anything to do with what one would call values. Does science give any values? I believe yes. Now, what is it that science tells us about ourselves? A huge number of things. All of them eminently elevating to the human enterprise, very ennobling the human what could those be? Science, for example, in contrast to 
the claims of chosen people that God has decided are his messengers and who would then people the world you are working with some of those I see uh, the tribes that go and develop and multiply and spread their values I am thinking of Israel and the Jewish clans or the ones who will tell you that this is God's chosen land Aryabhan which is where civilization developed and which is the epitome of all human development and if you leave this land and cross the sea then you would have polluted yourself and when you come back you shall have to do Christ's as Gandhi had to do when he crossed the seas or that God exclusively revealed to you his idea, his vision in his language, not the language of the world but in the language of the guy who makes that claim to you and then in that book there is nothing about the equality of the human or the freedom of man or the positive prospects of living the modern life all of these seem to be belonging to yesterday not to me so religion is not giving us these values for the modern day on the other hand what is science telling us today Science does not tell us that any of us is a chosen person. In fact, what science does tell us, and especially so since the time of Darwin, but not uniquely from the time of Darwin, much before, already from the time of the Greeks, there has been reflection, there has been observation, and there has been conclusion made in favor of our common humanity. Already, much, much, much before the Christian era started or the mythology of the Christ got into the official story of the church, much before that. There were people in Greece who were saying all these fossils on land of sea animals indicates that there was once the sea in this area and that there has been evolution of some kind. Aristotle talked about that as well. But Aristotle did not do what Darwin did over 2000 years later. What Aristotle did was he made a hierarchy of animals and he said these are the little ones, these are the better evolved ones, these are the higher ones. A very intelligent hierarchy for somebody who can observe things carefully. What he did not do and what Darwin did is he drew this line connecting the smallest to the most complex life of our be. That means Darwin traced for us the evolution of this unicellular, probably very primitive structure of life to the multicellular structure where there is organisms developing organ systems and so on. This line tells us something about our origins. Those books also tell us about all things. Interestingly, one book will tell you that the origins are in sound. Origins are in sound, but not in any sound. It's in the sound of one particular language. And that is the own part. And that is from where the world was created. Similar thinking people from a similar part of the world are telling you that the world emerged from a giant egg, which is what the Brahmanda is, Anda meaning egg. And the great big egg gave birth to the world, the universe, the humans. There are other stories as well. But the idea that sound was the origin and the origin of life of the universe is not unique to Hinduism see those stories in, in the southern Australia, near the Australian region. You can hear those stories also in the island civilizations of the world and also in Africa. Doesn't really tell us much beyond the, uh, the happy idea that they had very good creative imagination where they were not able to find any facts. We have another story which tells us that all this was created in six days and then on a particular day 
the creator was resting and therefore that was the end of it uh, in terms of creation. Now in the process, a bit of mud was taken and that was fashioned into a human. And then that human was given some kind of divine anesthesia and then the rib of this person was yeah. broken and from that the other gender, woman was cut. Uh, what I don't understand is the unnecessary aspect of then putting the guy to sleep and then taking off the rib. There must be more mud which could have been used to make another human. But this was the limitation of the imagination of that time. Contrary to that, opposing that and throwing light where there really is speculation in the dark is the interesting discovery and knowledge that science gives us. That all of us were not created as men and women, either from mud or from a hip, but we evolved. Not only that, that you and I and everyone else here, the black and the white and the conservative and the liberal, the man and the woman, we all have a common origin in what would be our ancestral biological mother because we know that through an examination of the DNA because the maternal DNA is what we get. We don't get DNA from the fathers. And that examination tells us that all of us have an origin in East Africa to a lady who might be traced to something like 200,000 years. And that, I think, is a deeply moving information about our origins. It's not about chosen people. It's not about exclusive hierarchies. It's not someone telling you, you were born from the head of God, and others from the shoulders, some from the thighs, some from the feet, and some from nowhere, because they didn't even belong to the human species. Please note that none of these four categories were ever born like how normal humans are born. Yeah? Head, shoulders, eyes, necks and so on. Compare that to the discovery and the understanding that we all have one biological ancestral mother here, but many fathers. And that we belong to that tribe from where we have multiplied and occupied really the entire world. Is something which on the basis of fact unites us in our common humanity and in our common ancestry. That's interesting. That is not caste that divides us, which is supported by religion, which is supposed to give us values. But it is through this understanding of what we are that we get this feeling of solidarity, of being one with the other. This is there is not one religion which will tell you that men and women are equal. So I can't look for values in these ancient books of yesterday with their fanciful tales when they had to be spun in darkness. There is light. <coughs> Very often a misused quote is that of Einstein. That Einstein supposedly said that religion without science is lame and that science without religion is blind. This is used to support the idea that science will take us nowhere. It has only given us a nuclear bomb and nothing else. Whereas religion has saved us. Oh really? Has religion been saving humanity? From when? Which religion? In what way? How? What is the evidence for this claim? Nothing. On the other hand, the ones who used the nuclear bomb were deeply religious people, not humanists or atheists. So, they were steeped in the idea of the inequality of the human and of the chosenness of the origins of people, that they didn't mind exterminating people. All the colonialists, all the exploiters of the world went with their book, the holy book, and their religion to establish civilization wherever they occupy. It's not science which is responsible. It's the values, the unequal values of religion which cause that to happen. What science has done is it has enabled us to continue
continue our search for truth, which is actually the origins and the basis of religion itself. That is how the religious enterprise started. We started asking these questions about who we are and what defines us as humans and what would be the morality of the person and what would be the ultimate destination of the human. Now the answers to who are we and where do we come from, how did this universe originate were as I was saying to you. The universe was created in six days and the seventh day was a day of rest. The universe was created out of sound and so on. This sound is not the noise of the Big Bang, of course. They are completely different ways of understanding. But what started as genuine inquiry and reflection on how the universe, the man, origins, destiny and so on would be, was stuck by answers which had no foundation in facts. That is the fate of all answers, whether founded in ignorance or in knowledge, temporary, because knowledge changes, we get greater insights into things and we change our conclusions about the universe. This is what happened in science. Now, the enterprise of religion is an enterprise of answers. The answers are permanent in religion, which is why for 4,000 years, 2,000 years, 1,400 years, one would refuse to change the answers. On the other hand, Science being the enterprise of questions, because the questions are permanent, not the answers. Science is able to upgrade its conclusions based on the latest knowledge. The scientist would be excited when a new fact is discovered, because then you would rework your theories. The religious guy would be bloody annoyed with you that you brought out new theories, and then they would punish you for that. It would be blasphemy. It means religion, reflecting intolerance, or it would be this vain and stupid effort, as happens in the United States, of trying to get creationism in as a scientific theory. Everyone knows its nonsense, including the judge, who, a fundamentalist evangelical person, said, But that is religion, design, intelligent design, has nothing to do with science. Now, it's clear. And that is religion's dying attempt to use the instruments of the state to establish itself. So on the one hand, we have the closed system of answers which are permanent. On the other hand, the open system of finding out facts about the universe. Finding out facts about things is simply the same as a search for truth. Because truth is nothing but the aggregation of the facts that we know. All the big data you have about the world, that you would bring it together and you create the complex history and the reality of the world. That is the set search for truth. The search for truth, which is dishonest, will end in it being closed, not admitting of any new facts or of any dissidents. On the other hand, science is of that open character where new facts are welcomed, they are integrated, processed and you create some other new picture of the world. It's not that Galileo is completely wrong, but something has been done which makes us have a better picture, the basis being the same. It's not that Newton is wrong, at least he's not wrong in the macro objects, but it could be that at the quantum level, some more insight into the universe is made. So science develops with open arms, embracing all new knowledge. That's not a value. The value of inviting new facts about the universe is a supreme value. Now, science has a method. The method is rigorous and it is open for inspection, evaluation, rejection, adoption. Does religion have that? There is not one single religion which has ever said, Oops, I made a mistake, I'm going to change my book. The one single woman who said, let's change the book, Taslima Nasri, does not stay in the country where she dared to say that. She's somewhere here in the US, if not in Sweden and that's The one who says the answers must be changed is immediately put to death if it is a closed system of religion. On the other hand, scientists Every day are telling us 
that yesterday's theory might be wrong. And I'm excited to tell you I have something else to propose to you about the nature of the universe, the land, and so on and so forth. That's an open system of values. So, so much for Einstein being wrongly put. Because when Einstein said, religion without science is this, and science without this is that, the story of the handicapped people. That's not what Einstein meant when he's talking about religion. In his own words, Einstein was a German, with a heavy German accent, and a reasonable English. But in the 1940s, in the 1950s, when Einstein was speaking English, the word religion was used by Einstein. Not to talk of a religion of the book, not to talk of a religion of revelation, not to talk of a re religion of a regulation and profit and an unchangeable conclusion about the universe. Einstein himself explained that for want of a better word, for that feeling of exhilaration and joy and wonderment about the universe, he used the word religion. He didn't mean it to be revelation, he didn't mean it to be dogma, superstition, holy. He himself was a humanist in the tradition that I am proudly a member of. Einstein is not the only one. Today, still today, as per the date, we are celebrating the birthday, supposedly, of the Buddha. Wrongly called by some, Lord Buddha. The Buddha was born like anybody else, human. And he was born at a time in India. The Buddha was not Indian, he's Nepalese. He was born in Nepal, he died in India, he preached in India. But this guy from Nepal, he was born in a time when people were trying to understand the universe in natural terms. This is an extraordinary discovery about the past of the country where we can draw our origins from. This was the time of the Samkhyas, the time of the Vaisheshikas. People who were saying, like the Sankhya's day, that nothing cannot be created out of nothing, meaning that there cannot be no there can be no creation, that it has to always exist as it is. Matter can neither be destroyed nor created in high school basic science terms. The Sankhya's were already saying that. The Vaisheshikas already told us that the universe was made of atoms. It doesn't matter that the atoms they were talking of and the atom we understand are not the same. It's not that the words are the same, it's that at a time in humanity's infancy, when we were trying to think of the origins of the universe and understanding nature, here were the first people in that part of the world who were looking for natural explanations about nature instead of supernatural explanations. That's the uniqueness of the times in which the Buddha was born. Now, how does one live in a world without a god? Because all these gods were peopling the world at that time. And the Buddha's unique contribution, even though today might not be his birthday, because the way they calculate the date of birth is not the way we normally do it. It's like the date's birthday. There is no real fixed date. Celebrated three times in the year. The importance and the significance of the Buddha's birth, whenever that was, was for the first time in a clearly articulated manner. We have one human who is telling us about a morality which does not require a law. That's unique. It's unique for his times. It's more significant than what Socrates said. Socrates, even before dying, was talking about the rooster he had to sacrifice to a goddess, which was not done by him, and he was asking and urging his disciples to go and fulfill that, that duty towards that goddess. The Buddha was not The value of science is in the tradition of what the Buddha inaugurated that we will waste our time thinking and reflecting on the existence of God because we will have no meaningful conclusion.
illusion about that. And that it would be a right way of living which we should consider. This right way of living we have updated through human experience since the time of the Buddha. The Buddha is no God, he has no final answer to us. He knew very little science than any of the distinguished panelists here who spoke today, much less. The Buddha probably knew less about the world than a fifth standard student, a student in his school. It's not that. It's the wisdom of the man that we are employing. But since then, the understanding of the equality of the human, at least in dignity, if not in opportunity. The recognition that each of us is from a common origin. And therefore, there is a moral equality for us. And hence, also, there is a human solidarity that we can express. The understanding that our morality, that we are able to be good, not because of God, but because of millions of years of evolution in the biological world, which has led to a system and a method of living in society. Society is simply the human herd. Any animal group would form a herd and it has its roots. And very few animals kill each other, except in the conflict of mating or marking territory. And that too rarely. Even there they push away rather than kill. Now, lions kill fellow lions much less than humans kill fellow humans. The lions never read the Quran, the Bible, the Vedas, they never got their morality. The way the beasts live is a method which is rooted in their biology. Why is it different with humans? It's not. Our morality too is rooted in the biology and the evolution of the humans to what they are today. And in the recognition of the human is a recognition of the dignity and in the recognition of the uniqueness of the human, and that is what science tells us, not something else, is the recognition of human values which make us distinct from other forms of human. In celebrating the uniqueness of the human, in acknowledging the values that bind us all together, in understanding the solidarity that should be there because of our common origins, through our biological ancestry. We have a vision of society which is quite in contrast to the vision of the divisiveness of religion, of caste, of chosen people, of believer, non-believer, and so on. Every believer of a religion is a non-believer of another religion. And that is where the fount of intolerance is. And in contrast to that, is the value of science and the values that science gives us through a knowledge of who we are. The relentless pursuit of the truth can happen only in the open-minded inquiry that is instituted in us in the method of science, where my claim to knowledge is not revelation, but an invitation to you to try the same method that I did. Therefore, you could discover it yourself. It's not the silly nonsense of you two do yoga so you will know what it is. This is a practical, get your hands dirty aspect of work with a peer group, a reference and approval or not a rejection of your claims to what it is. There is experiment, there is theory, there is verification, there is rejection, there is moving forward. That's the rigorous method of science. Now, science is a word which is new in the way we use it. So is democracy in the way we use it. The, the uh, ancient republics of India had a voting system, but so did many tribal clans where they voted their own leader who would protect them. Nothing very special or great about it. They were just electing somebody to rule over them. The democracy we talk of is a democracy where we select a representative, not a ruler, to represent us, not to rule over us. In dysfunctional democracies, that's not how it works, but that's the principle. That's the kind of principle where city officials feel obliged to come and speak to 10 people, to tell them 
This I got plans for your city. Then I can't do it. Call them they come. Now, this culture, this culture where a new word, science, because earlier all pursuit of knowledge was called philosophy. I'm speaking uniquely of the English language. And science was introduced to talk about a systematic approach to the collection of knowledge, facts leading to truth. The word democracy where each of us is recognized as capable of directing and deciding the direction of their personal lives. There's no more destiny. No one is born with something rewritten, whether that be on the forehead or elsewhere. Or nobody is born with a special privilege of birth. One is born with birth and one is born with potential. Where each of us is able and capable of deciding what our lives are about. The questions that were so badly answered by religion about what are the reasons for life, the purpose of life, are uniquely answered by this modern mind which says life has no purpose beyond what we give to it. And it is for us to decide what that purpose should be, for us to fashion without being interfered with by others in the spirit of freedom in society where that is valid. That's in tune with the values of science because it's where you connect, it's where you decide what the facts are, not through dogma, analysis, getting information and making that claim to information open to scrutiny by it. So democracy human values which are universal. Now, my land is holy and therefore unless you shout in glory and in praise of your mother land, you will not even be allowed to stay in the country. It's from a primitiveness of the mind where one is talking of tribal loyalties to geography, something that Tagore discarded as the idolatry of geography. From there, we move to one where the world is one and we are one and we expand and we go wherever we can to celebrate our common humanity and to participate in society as equal members within certain, obviously, some legal frameworks. And that's the gift of science, the scientific understanding of humanity, of society, of what we are capable of. Just conclusion I will want us to reflect on the greatness that science and the scientific method has bestowed on us. In just the last four months, we have an idea of the origin of the universe. We have a measure of the universe and its age and of its size, its immensity of its size. We have an understanding of our place our minute existence, the vastness of reality. And yet, we are able to, with the help of science, understand the beauty of nature and the nature of beauty. Both, both are given to us by science, not simple speculation. The beauty of truth and the truth of beauty are united in the scientific enterprise. Anything that science is dragged, how is it dragged? Which picture painted for you by which artist is more beautiful than what the Hubble telescope can capture for you? Which vision of the world is grander than the one that Darwin or Galileo or Copernicus or Aristotle or Archimedes, they have offered? The excitement of discovery of how the universe functions, how we are part of our universe. This understanding is grander than any other understanding imposed to us through our childhood days when we are subjected to so much of brainwashing, to accept the unreal as real. To understand that the misery of man or the woman is really the result of what you did in your previous birth and 
to talk of it as if it is fact today, the stupidity of that understanding that dead people can be born again. And it's unique that we speak about it in a restaurant where there is one vegetarian sir. Imagine that all the chickens you were eating all your life would come back to life. Because everything that dies can be reborn. And supposing that was a good chicken, then it might not be reborn as a chicken, it might become a good camel, or it could be a horse or an elephant, or if it was a very pious chicken, it might be born as a Brahmin. Now imagine that person taking revenge on the way that or to be the truth. Now to to take the stupid idea that dead people can be reborn, to fashion from there a philosophy of life, and to attribute to that the cause of the origin of the misery of human life with the compassion is a sure way in which to make sure that the Indians could not, would not, should not, will not change the way their lives are. Because it's not your fault. It's something that happened before you were born. And because of the accumulated sins of the last life, this is what you should be. And therefore, all human enterprise is meaningless. Of course, when you decide that the universe, the world is unreal, it is Maya, why would you even examine the illusion? Therefore, you would not develop the culture of science. All science developed in India before the idea of Maya came. The great achievements of India, and there are so many achievements of India, of the ancient times, but before, before the idea that the world is an illusion came in. In the beginning were the Charvakas, the Sankhyas, there was the Buddha. There was also Ajita Kesa Kamali who was scolding the Buddha for not being open enough about his beliefs. And they were the ones who started the tradition of looking for freedom in this world. Then came the idea that the world is unreal. And they started looking for freedom from this world. That killed any enterprise that would look into the origins, the functioning, and the purpose of human life, the universe, and so on. If we were to bring together all this into what could be a philosophy of life for the modern person, one which celebrates the equality of the human and the potential of each of us, not of the gang and the group, but of each of us to recognize the uniqueness of the person, of the human person, to celebrate the dignity of that human person. If we were to do that, if we were to bring a system that will recognize all this in a practical process of getting from the people the decisions they are making about their lives, all your big data work, then that would become what would be a democratic arrangement in society. And it need not be once every five years with modern technology. It will be a continuous aggregation of collection of people's wishes so that there is a direction given to human affairs. And if we were to then look at the values of the human as secular in origin, which bring all of us together with no distinction either of belief or of disbelief, non belief or of orthodoxy then we are creating a new culture. That's the culture that was inaugurated a long time ago in India, in ancient Greece, in parts of Egypt and elsewhere, including some of the Hebrew traditions, which got taken over by the religions and enterprise rather than even the free minds, which can be brought back to That would be a new culture. And that culture would be the culture of science. Today, what we have is culture versus science. Today we have a system, a method, a situation where science and culture are opposed to each other in popular media, regular popular debates and so on. We should stop the idiocy of this discussion. There is nothing called culture versus science. Either it's orthodoxy or ignorance versus science. Or it is the culture of science. And this is what I want to share with you.
Alex Davis.